All right, we're live. Hey everybody, Tara Bachland here, and I'm here with renowned astrologer, medical astrologer, vocational astrologer, and I think we can add a few more to that list, um, but really a pra practitioner of more years than she'd like to admit. <laughs> Judith Hill, we'll say this many decades, five decades. <laughs> And that just means incredible experience and insights. And I'm so pleased to be, to have Judith here and work with Judith. And today we're going to talk about how to become a medical astrologer. You know, medical astrology it is kind of the buzz these days is like the new, you're just hearing the rumblings of it in the astrology community, but it's been around practically forever. Hasn't it Judith? Oh yes. It was developed. It's beginnings are back in the ancient Greek period sometimes called the Hellenistic period, beginning to get sewn together in, you know, in the 400s um, BC. And it has very rivulets coming in from Egypt and Babylonia and Mesopotamia, but it wasn't really a form system until the Greek period. And then it reached its pinnacle in the late medieval and Renaissance period. In the Renaissance England, we have our, uh, the, the physicians who are making diaries and people need to know throughout the medieval renaissance period until 1666 every physician needed to who had a license had to pass his astrological exams and they were at a very high level of astrological skill so to become a physician you actually had to be a medical astrologer as well for 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 how long how many centuries or Oh, probably. Well, I know, uh, see, when the, the universities began to be founded, you know, one by one, they adopted astrological chairs, so probably uh, 1400s through 1600s, definitely. But it was in the toolkit all the way back from, uh, you know, probably 450 BC, and definitely through the medieval period of uh, the, the uh, Persian and Jewish and Arab astrologers of the whole medieval period, you know, like 700 to 1200 were all using it. They had to, it was part of their toolkit. This, you know, we have herbalism, medical astrology, and patient examination with the urine, the blood, the pulse. This was the system in use throughout the Middle East, uh, Spain, Europe, for the medieval, and uh, it went into Europe in the Renaissance period, the late into the 1400s in Italy and so forth. So we should probably even back up a step because people are really familiar with psychological astrology, um, modern astrology, like uh, what kind of partner is best, which, which sign is best for me. So how does that translate to medical astrology? How do we bridge that, that understanding? Well, medical astrology was <clears throat> one of the very first uses of astrology ever. And what it is, it's a study what is medical astrology? It's a study of how the influences of the planets through whatever means they do it, some think it's cosmic color rays, uh, how they influence our, they come in, they're, they're, our minds, our, our spirits, our emotions, and our physical bodies, both innately at birth from our birth chart, or what are our, our physical propensities, and through timing. Why was I perfectly healthy till I hit 22 years old and then I had a health problem? You know, this is the study of timing and it's just excellent for surgery, fertility, these sort of purposes. And so that, and, and you know, all astrologers use timing. It's a study of the quality of time. And this is so beneficial for medical purposes and for all other purposes. You know, what's interesting is we, we learn astrology by hindsight, right? Um, and if we're, we're, we have enough practice, we can look a little bit, maybe pr predict, see a few things in the future. And it, as I've learned astrology, actually through medical astrology, I didn't necessarily start other than sun signs, you know, through learning astrology. It's helped me to solve a few things that in the past would have been really helpful to know. So for example, um, now I'll share, I'm, I'm okay with sharing a bit of my chart. Um, but you know, a lot of people, if they know, let's say, would you say standard astrology or psychological astrology know about the Saturn return. So that's, you know, right around 30 or a little bit before in, uh, 60, maybe a little bit before where Saturn is returning to the same spot 
in transit to your natal Saturn. And um, it can be a rough patch, uh, just to say the least. And But it shows up differently from what I've conversed with other people about. And that was a really tough time for me. But to relate to that in a sense, um, in another way, so there are different kind of patterns that show up. So as a kid, I was chubby, which like people look at me and they're like, that's not even possible. And, but I'm a Capricorn rising. And I remember from where your, where your classes about the physiognomy that how a person appears can even show up based upon their sun or rising sign, particularly the rising sign. Would you say more often? I would say, I would say sun, rising sign, and the moon, especially for ladies, and the, the position of the ruler of the ascendant sign. And it, it's, a, it's about a third of each with the sun, moon, and ascendant. It varies. And the planets that are closest to your ascendant. I actually have a book on this, the astrological body types that goes into all this. But the, the um, many, many people will look a lot like their ascendant. Others, you look like the ruler of your ascendant, or it is very, very much but we won't go into that because it gives you a chart away. Uh, so so uh, the, uh, uh, and the Saturn return, you see people, the psychological uh, interpretation of astrology has become popular since around 1900 with Alan Leo bringing that in heavily and the works of Jung and Freud being coincident to that exact period. It's a long story how that happened, but it's actually quite amusing. Um, you will love this, uh, Alan, at that time, uh, astrology was illegal in England and he would get arrested. So Alan Leo, he was all the buzz. He was the astrologer at the time. Wait, and his last name was Leo? Leo, Alan <laughs> Leo. I forgot his real name. It might've been, was it Walter Gorn? Oh, that might've been Raphael. But anyway, he had. A, I think he gave himself that name. I'm not sure. But okay. he had been arrested twice and finally thrown in jail briefly for practicing astrology under the vagrancy laws. So at this time, Jung and Freud were starting psychological counseling. It's between 1910, 1920. So he advised all the astrologers of England to get around the vagrancy laws by practicing a form of psychological counseling using the astrological chart. And it took hold like crazy because you can now do this without needing a license. And it is it has basically became so overwhelmingly popular through the modern era that medical astrology and even the more practical branches of astrology began to be forgotten. And I've kind of made it my life work to bring it back. These other brands, the psychological is very, very, very important and helpful to everyone. But example, on the Saturn return, and people are going through all this stuff, this is Saturn rules your larger life timing and it turns on and off the switches of the body. You know, menopause, aging, you know, when your teeth come in as a baby. So you're, you finish up one round of physical growth. The brain finishes up around 28, 29 at the Saturn return. The wisdom teeth finish up. You are now a completed adult and the process of aging begins. So you're on the upswing until your Saturn return. And now, whoopsie, the slow decline to old age begins, which we fight. So that's how important it is physically. And this, this informs these psychological, emotional changes. People get a lot more mature at this time, or they wanna be a parent, or it's time for them to choose a career because they're no longer children. And the youthful body period is now over. You are in a switch point into becoming a full adult. And this is how, uh, you see it as a medical astrology. And the body often changes around at that time. It's fascinating. I, now I remember why I was bringing up Saturn return because I remember getting my first astrology reading at my, and I didn't know it was my Saturn return. And the astrologer is like, it's your Saturn return. And I have it recorded. And I was like, what's a Saturn return? And he's like, well, it's why all this stuff is, <laughs> is going on. And it was such a relief to just have some kind of explanation. Cause it just seemed like such a chaos uh, and just like, oh, so difficult. And similarly, when I was a kid being chubby and like, you know, I, of course I, I ate processed sugar. There were, you know, didn't 
wasn't too active, but was just like inordinate, inordinately chubby. And then I learned from your classes that, well, Capricorn, it can be either thin or they have a very stout physiognomy or, or physical appearance. And, you know, there are just times like that where I think astrology, astrology is especially helpful. You know, it, it's kind of like a good friend saying, well, you know, the reason why you're going through this or the reason why this is happening is this. And sometimes just having, maybe it doesn't help the situation right away and changing it, but just having a little bit of reason behind it can help settle the mind. Yes, and, 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 and Capricorn being the sign governed by Saturn has to work with time more than any other sign. And you often see Capricorns go along for years and then they'll have a very, very major shift in life or suddenly change their physical appearance from thin to fat or fat to thin. And after, you know, any, any of either seven, 14, 21 or 28 years, Saturn works on seven year cycles. But, you know, Saturn is the ruler of Capricorn. So you get more of this this uh, tendency. You know, a lot of Capricorn rising start out sickly and weakly and then outlive everyone and they're pottering around in their yard when everybody else you know can't walk anymore. And so you get that effect with, with Saturn also. Well, I've enjoyed my gardening, so I'll, I'll opt for the latter. <laughs> it's been <laughs> fun. <laughs> So how long, so when and where, I mean, you started medical astrology, so maybe back, back up a step. Did you start out as a medical astrology or astrologer or how did you start out? I started out with what was available to me, which was a study my father was teaching me a very, you know, I was very young as a child, a very, uh, he was uh, teaching me just basic astrology at that time, you know, this planet, signs, the planets, the houses. And I just learned the basic structure from him. And I was obsessed all through junior high, they now call it middle school, but all through junior high and high school with how people looked in relation to their charts. And I never heard of medical astrology, but I was basically studying it on my own, kind of refinding it. And then I would go down to these old bookstores and I'd find these old, old, old books and I finally discovered, you know, sometime in my teens, early 20s, that there was something called medical astrology. At the same time, I was mad crazy about herbology when I had no idea that herbalism was even a career. I think we had one herbal teacher that I was able to find in my late 20s in my area. And uh, so I was just kind of studying all this without even knowing it was a field. And then I very gradually realized it was. And I, I was, I just, when I look at a chart, I see vocation, what the person was made for, and I see physical body. I don't see the psychological stuff everybody's looking at. I have to really think about that. How does that affect them, you know, in their, with a relationship with their parents and all that? I'm not even concerned. That's not where my mind goes. Everyone's different. So I, I just began to craft this. But in this, at the same time, I was fascinated with timing and making astrology highly useful to my clients. So I was timing, you know, the day to purchase the new bicycle, the trip, the marriage. And I was studying timing and I could find one book on it. I crafted methods and I'm, I'm working full time every day for years. And I got very good at timing and then i went wait a minute people are starting to ask for surgery timing now that's the hardest thing you can learn to do but i learned to do it i was able to find a few phrases in one book which was vivian robeson's book on general election of timing just a one or two pages of caveats for surgeries and gradually discover you know work that into an art form and i've taught I mean, two people how to do it and so it, it's been incredibly useful, absolutely wonderful. I feel it should be in every medical clinic. And so uh, surgical timing is, is finding the best dates for the best outcome for surgery? Yes, for people who you know, have voluntary choice of their surgery date, don't have to go tomorrow. Uh, the, uh, you can pick dates that are far safer than other dates for them. 
Do you find that most patients when they go to their doctors, are the doctors receptive to this or do you, how do you negotiate that? How do you work with someone? Well, doctors are just as uh, very, just as different as everybody else. Some, some uh, doctors would think this was ridiculous and that timing and the sun and moon have no influence on human life. Uh, and other doctors are, like, of course, uh, you, know, you, you pick the best surgery date. And I even picked the best surgeon. Some mm. people give me a list of surgeons to choose from. They just get the birthday and year. You do not want a surgeon that is your secret enemy, do you? Or a surgeon that secretly hates women and you're having a gynecological surgery. So, you know, I, I will pick uh, the best surgeon and I will pick the best surgery date. But I can't do it right now because I'm developing this new academy, but I did do it for years and years. And I have names of people who do, do this service right now. I'll return to it next year, you know, probably. It's well, a, there's a class on, on the selecting the best surgery dates in the, the academy. Yes, we do. Uh, we do have a, uh, we have a three hour section on how to, uh, it's a video uh, we talk how to do safe surgery dates get you started. And we also have, I believe, uh, an audio class with notes that was done a lot earlier with these wonderful little notes. So I think we have two sections. Plus, I have a very exhaustive write-up, the most exhaustive I've ever seen on how, called How to Select Safe Surgery Dates in two chapters in my book, Medical Astrology, A Guide to Planetary Pathology got lots of books out it's the big square orange one medical astrology a guide to planetary pathology two chapters for the astrologer on how to uh, do safe surgery dates and that with the the video and the audio and the notes get you going uh get the person going so the books are at your site judithhillastrology.com and the online courses, which are also accessible through your site, are at the Academy for Astrological Medicine, and people can find them there. Now, you were saying, we kind of jumped to like the most difficult, you said selecting surgery dates is the most difficult thing to do, um, but does that preclude anyone who's just a beginner in astrology from getting into medical astrology, or should, are there some good prerequisites? Oh, that is the best question. There are some techniques that are so good that almost always work that, not to push another book, but I have a little book called Medical Astrology for Health Practitioners. Tiny little book lists those techniques. Someone with no knowledge of astrology, all they have to do is discover the sign that their Saturn is in and they can get started. Mm. And they can move to the sign of their Mars, and the sign of their South node. They can get started. Then you can learn a little about your sun sign and the type of vital force and physical and disease propensities of the sun sign. And you know that, that's so easy. I have all that in this little book, but you don't even have to be an astrologer. If you're a health practitioner or you just know your chart, you find the position of Saturn first and you learn why that's so important. And it will tend to, to be the seat of uh, future problems, often, not in every case, if you don't take care of it. Why? Saturn is very cold and astringent. He's cold and drying. Drying in the ancients didn't mean drying, like drying the laundry. It meant pushing out, you know, in Saturn's case, pushing out fluid. He builds bone. So it's about dry like a bone. So what happens if a certain body part is too dry and cold? not enough oxygen, not enough blood, poor circulation, tight muscles. This can cause all kinds of problems over a long period of time. Saturn is the Lord of long periods of time. So he's so often the seat of chronic disease. And you just need to find for beginners the sign he's in because each sign rolls a one a, a horizontal zone of the body. So you have a great intro course to medical astrology at the Academy, and you're speaking of the zones. Uh, those are illustrated in a graphic as well. 
Uh, what's interesting is you bring up Saturn, you know, we even have this language still in our language. And I'm fascinated by the language that we use that we don't always remember where it came from. Yeah. And uh, I was about to go on a tangent, but I'll, I'll refrain. But I love fun stuff like that. But so we have the word Saturnine that people will use and maybe not realize where it refers to. But I when you're talking about cold, dry, drying out, brittle, I, I think it, it even illustrates the aging process. That's typically as a person ages, they get drier, they get more brittle, their muscles get smaller, their bones get brittle and drier and colder. And I used to have a real fat face. Things, things just sort of, and we have so many, this, you brought that up, you know, Terrell, it's very good with languages. I, I love that. And, and uh, uh, we have words like uh, that are medical still. Venus governs the veins and venereal diseases. We have the solar plexus. We have mm -hmm. lunacy, lunacy. Uh, Mercury, his, his staff that the god Mercury carries, the caduceus, that is the symbol of the medical profession today. And the medical profession, you'll love this, still uses the, the astrological symbols for Venus and Mars for male and female. Those same symbols you see scrawled on bathroom walls, you see in medical textbooks today. Yes, it's so fascinating. I love, I love learning about those. And one, I re okay, the, you want to hear the one I was thinking of? It doesn't relate to astrology, but it's really funny in my mind. So apparently, in in this part of Minnesota, so I'm in almost central Minnesota and part of Wisconsin, we have a phrase that is a horse a piece, that apparently. Almost nowhere else, unless you're from this area, people don't know that phrase. I even said that to someone from Portland one day and she's like, or, or Oregon, somewhere in Oregon. And she's like, the horse of peace? And I'm like, well, that's a great <laughs> um, a version of it. But um, <laughs> incidentally, it's, I don't remember the exact explanation, but it's a gambling term from back in the day. So it's like six of one, half a dozen of the other is what it means. But it's, a, and it's an old gambling term, uh, a horse, a horse apiece. So that's the one that came to mind, not astrology related, but just like, wow, it's so funny. Yeah, language gets handed down, but this is the the remnant of the that this was such the, such an important part of of the physician's work until till uh, the late 1600s. So when you were you you, you kind of just started it. In, astro in medical astrology from the beginning, it sounds. And to be clear, when you started out, I'm pretty sure neither astrology nor herbalism were legal. Is that correct? I, I know for sure that astrology was not legal until I think either it was about uh, 1988 or 89 in my area, something like that, not legal. And herbalism, I have no idea if it was legal or not, but it was not coming in and finally an herbal store came in right about that same time, a uh, big herbal store and herbs started to take off or herbs as they say in Australia and England begin to take off. Uh, but it was very, very difficult getting training, good training and information in either field. There were very few books. In fact, if a new astrology book came out, I remember when Humanistic astrology came out. I forgot the author. A new, and everybody would call each other. There's a new astrology book out. And you'd all run down to the bookstore and try to get it because there'd be this precious new astrology book. And now, you know, 100 are coming out every day. Yeah. And it's become, you know, a whirlwind and people self publish and so forth. Do you think that people who had to really struggle like that to learn a, a trade that you're just innately passionate about, do you think there's something that? actually makes you learn it even better? Well, yes, in a sense. And you have to be so predisposed for it that in those days to take on this path meant you would be have derision, you'd be derided. You might get um, lose your job if someone found out you were an astrologer. Uh, people may not want to date you. Uh, it was always made fun of. There was a, apparently a law on the books that if astrology was presented in the media, if they were gonna interview you in any way, 
they had to make you look ridiculous. They had to make fun or make it clownish. And so I stopped doing all media stuff because yes, they always would. Mm. And they could not take it seriously. It was listed and still is in both vocational guides as entertainment and entertaining career, not taken seriously. So you had to be willing to go it alone and face derision from your family, your friends, and you just had to love it. it you had to be made for it. This is certainly not the case today, but we were definitely a courageous lot. I would say uh, we were seen as eccentrics or we were people would think that you were crazy or you were fraudulent uh, or just you know had rice pudding between your ears and people would laugh at you. And so you had to be very, very dedicated to become a serious astrologer. Now I've heard you say that your father, even before you were born, knew that a astrologer soul would be coming into your, his family. And so, but it seems like you truly, like that's really true. Like, you, you know, inside and out, you know, astrology is your thing. Um, but you did talk about other career paths that you were interested in. I guess I have multiple questions in here. So yeah. did you did you ever feel that, it, well, maybe just you look like you already have some answers for that. Let's, let's, let's hear it. <laughs> I was gonna give you the family story about that, my dad's family story. I don't know if you wanted to hear that because it's amusing, but um, I had many other career paths because I knew that this would be not accepted. Uh, but I loved it and I couldn't stop doing it. And obviously but, your father supported it. So you didn't have that issue. He did. He actually, he actually kind of thought that this is what I should do. And his mother also bought me my very first book. But the other side of my family were all skeptics, my mother's side. And I kind of thought I was nuts. But the, um, I, I very much loved herbalism, but it wasn't available to me. Uh, I would have been a rabbi. That wasn't available to me. I wanted to go to, I, I could have been, a, uh, I love genetic science. I love history. Um, but a higher, the higher college wasn't available to me. I went to the city college because my parents didn't have the money. And no one was into helping me because I was a girl. Uh, there was no particular like, oh, you want a career? What's that? That would you mind on. sharing the era that this was? I, I know. I don't like to explain my age away. I, I really don't. But I, it, it was a uh, decade, maybe. I think it helps us contextually understand the history and how things have really changed. Yeah, I'd say 70s and 80s. Okay, thank you. That period, yeah. I know that's a special request, so thank you. Long time ago now. And uh, so, you know, I, I was uh, on my own very, very early and had to make a living. And I'm a scholar, I would study apps. I come from a long line of scholars on my mother's side. I would study everything possible. I love knowledge. And I went to um, the, uh, what is it? The local city college, you know, pick up a skill. And which now today is interestingly helpful to me, but I studied language. I studied many, many things, which I, I feel now were perfect for an astrologer to study. And uh, which is, which bring uh, you know, the person to greater depth and breadth. And uh, so, you know, there's, I studied anthropology, I studied music, I became a professional musician and did great, a lot of recordings and vocalist. I studied um, art, I studied history, I studied theology and all religions. I studied anthropology, uh, I studied physical anthropology, I studied palmistry, numerology, handwriting analysis, phrenology, and etymology. I just study everything. What are, what are phrenology and etymology? Phrenology is the study of the face, facial features and the different bumps on the head and what they, what they indicate. Some people think it's, it's nonsense. Believe me, it's not. <laughs> it's, you can learn a lot about people. It tells about one aspect of people. I've studied etymology as the history of words, like every word you use, where does that word come from? What is its trail? So, you know, I was just fascinated with everything. My parents would go to Sears Roebuck shop and they would just drop me in the bookstore and come get me two hours later when I was 10. I, you set me down, I love to study. 
But mm -hmm. I, I was athletic. You know, I, I believe in a balanced life. I was a very good athlete when I was young and uh, a very good musician. In fact, I train, I feel all of my students need to have adjunct skills. No one should just study only astrology. They'll get much too mental. Uh, I love my students to either be good cooks, carpenters, uh, gardeners. Those are my three favorite. Music is very helpful, but to keep the heart alive and to keep the senses alive. Uh, there is a danger to studying astrology all day unbalanced. It's all star knowledge. It has its effect. What do you see typically happens? People can get lost in uh, constant uh, mental you know, just the mental intellectual ideations. Uh, it can cause a very brittle effect on the ego if a person becomes an unbalanced astrologer. They need to keep a, a lack of compassion. It gets very Saturnian, Saturnine. So to, develop, to keep the heart alive and to keep the um, senses, the connection with the earth plane, to keep practical, you know, learn how to be a good carpenter, uh, this helps you, or mechanic. You know, I studied mechanics. I worked in a bike shop for six months. I totally understand a bicycle. Uh, I study mechanics, and uh, I can fix most things. The mechanics is a wonderful abject study because astrology is astral mechanics. Mm. It's the science of how the the astral color, cosmic color rays are weaving together and they're always unique and how they will influence a person. You have to really work it out if you're, you're going to be a pro. That's so interesting because, you know, it could set someone at ease if they're, maybe they're a chef or something they're like, I just, I love this astrology thing, but I don't know if I can make the switch or, but hearing how, and isn't it true, you know, as we go along in life, the things that we learned earlier really show up and are like, wow, that, that really did help in an area that I totally wouldn't have imagined yes it, it's it's amazing so um we have a motto at the my academy and the motto is altitudo latitudo et claritus and what it means in latin is depth breadth and clarity which i was always taught by my teacher and i believe strongly qualities very useful to all humans, but especially to being a good astrologer. So you need, you need depth, you need a great fund and bank of knowledge. And the word also means not only height in Latin, it means spiritual and emotional depth. So you have spiritual and emotional depth, but you also have height and breadth of your knowledge. And then, then the breadth, the latitude of, that means you know a lot about everything mechanics and anthropology and what's going on in the Congo and you know what's going on in, in Latvia and, and languages and you learn everything you can about everything because you're going to need it with all the different clients you're going to need to understand and then clarity means developing a very clear and judicious mind and my teacher in order to do this for me because I was a fuddy fuzzy headed 20 year old he had me watch Judge Judy every day for a year and a half <laughs> because she had a mind like a razor. And I learned- And she still mind. does. Oh my gosh, she's so impressive. So I study Judge Judy and I study the people in front of her and her mind was as sharp as a razor and the average person in front of hers was not. And in fact, trying to deceive her. And, and the whole time I watched, I also learned a tremendous amount about people. Hmm. The entire time I watched Judge Judy, only one person just said, yes, Judge, I did it, and did not try to run her around. And she said, yes, I did spit Coca-Cola on top of his head at the theater because he wouldn't stop talking, and she took her punishment. <laughs> <laughs> Which from Judge Judy, <laughs> she does not bear the punishment, rarely. Right. I know. I thought that was great. She had to pay him the, for the suit or something. But yeah. I realized that uh, this was a great training for me and it helped sharpen my mind. Mm -hmm. Learning the, the right teacher, the right coach can make such a huge difference. And it, definitely in my history and in trainings as well, 
that variety, you know, training, cross training, um, mixing things up can help a bunch. And sometimes, yeah, it's like the, the old martial arts uh, analogy or movie, right? Master, what does this waxing on and waxing off have to do with anything? And then later you learn. <laughs> yeah. Well, another, another meaning of clarity is becoming a, a darn good astrologer, but really learning your craft. And it's amazing how skilled the Renaissance astrologers were like William Lilly, Joseph Walgrave. They not only did their charts by hand, but they just had an incredible knowledge of their craft. And also to study all branches of astrology. I use all branches. There's seven or eight branches of astrology. They all require a year or two of study, at least, if not 10. I've studied every one of them and all of them are useful to all other branches mm. of astrology. So you don't just learn one little piece of the pie. You learn the whole pie. And Will you name a few of them so we have an idea of what you mean by a branch? Sure. Well, we know there's medical astrology, the study of the astrophysical, physical astrology. We have electional astrology, which is the setting of dates for important life events and like surgery or marriage or business opening. That's electional. You're creating an election. There's horary astrology, which is the astrology of making a chart to answer a specific question. This is quite an art form. There is natal astrology, which is very important for your medical astrologer and your psychological astrologer. It's the study of the birth chart and the basic imprint of that person on all levels. Then there is transit progress astrology, where you're looking at current influences to the birth chart. We then have synastry astrology, where you are combining charts for marriages, business, you know, business partners. You're seeing how you and your boyfriend influence each other, you and your girlfriend get along. Should you date this person? Should you buy this dog? Should you adopt that baby? You know, these are questions of the synastry astrologer. There's location astrology where you are studying maps of the world related to that person's natal chart. Now there is mundane astrology, M-U-N-D-A-N-E. And this is the science of using astrology for, um, you have for world purposes, you have political mundane, you have business astrology, which is a field of its own, you know, stock markets and businesses. You have astro meteorology, Weather predicting with astrology, very accurate. You have astro seismology. I worked for years in that field with scientific statistics. You have um, also use in uh, astro agricultural use for farming. Now, people should know that the Council of Trent back in the 1500s decided that all natural forms of astrology were fine. That included medical and all mundane and certain kinds of timing elections, but that judicial astrology went against the church because it interfered with the will of God. Hmm. And that was predictions for people. So astrologers are really uh, concerned, of, and they're Christian, they're very concerned about, you know, is, is astrology okay? The actual, you know, 15 popes practiced astrology Astrology as an entire science was not not okay. Only they decided late in the game, really, that the, the judicious branches weren't. But medical astrology remained completely fine, no problem. Even during the worst of the persecutions of astrologers, uh, the doctors still practiced medical astrology. And they had their charts and their little bags that they carried you know, telling them when the moon phases were where and what kinds of uh, surgery they could do that day. And uh, so this is important to know. It's so fascinating. And I could see how the person who would, who loves study, you know, uh, could just dive into astrology and go into all these branches and just be forever content. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you never, you never stop learning. I study every day. Every day I study something about herbology or anatomy. I'm always studying my anatomy. 
um, or I study something completely different, like some historical thing. I, I was very much into uh, Irish harp music this week. And, you know, in the pursuit of, uh, of depth, breadth, and clarity. Beautiful. So let's uh, try to, uh, I can go off in so many tangents, but, but perhaps now is a good time to kind of bring it together. If you had someone in front of you who, and there can be so many scenarios, right? When people say, I want to learn medical astrology. I want to be a medical astrologer. Let's say that, that that's the case. They want to be a, a practitioner. Um, how would you generally guide people these days? Well, first of all, they do need to know what their parameters are in their state, if they can, how they can practice it in their state, if they can practice it. Uh, certainly a person with any medical license can within their own, they can use a chart in their own practice for their own purposes. But um, you have to first know, to become a real medical astrologer, you got to know astrology pretty well. So you know, get your basics in astrology. What would and, be the basics for sure to cover? Um, learning, learning how to, um, to you know, get a horoscope, a birth chart, put up the transits for the day, uh, know the, the planets, what they look like and what signs they're in and what houses and the aspects between them. Those are your basic parts of the chart. And you could all get that in a one year course of astrology mm -hmm. and get and then you have to practice. And so you understand that chart really well. And I insist that my students do their charts in their own handwriting mm -hmm. because they tune into the universe that way. It's, you know, these, these pulling the chart off the computer reading a chart on the computer, it's like petting a cat with a glove on. You cannot get that personal connection you do. I've never ever read for a client ever that I did not copy the chart out in my own handwriting, ever. And usually I give them a copy. Now, um, so they need to know that. Then they need for medical astrology, you have to, it's helpful to study some anatomy and some etiology because you need to know a little about how the body works and diseases. And then you study the physical astrology. What would be etiology, just to clarify? That means the, so the causes of various diseases. Hmm. Like what causes, what causes diabetes? What causes liver failure? And you can just get a Merck manual and look it up when you need it, when you have a case. You don't have to memorize it all. I try to memorize it because I'm running an academy, but you know, you can, you can, have you know really good tools by your bedside but you need to know your now you need to interpret the chart physically and that's that's easy it's easy it's easier than psychological astrology because it's very mechanical and it doesn't take any psychic gift those psychic gifts are helpful so you learn saturn and what sign like bringing it home to the beginning of our talk what sign is saturn in that body part ruled by that sign is it having a problem and then every planet influences the body. And then you learn which houses are more pathological. But you also need to know how to take an intake form, how to ask good questions. Now, this is an art form. Many astrologers have not been trained in the art of asking questions. Hmm. And horary astrologers must learn this. I'll give you an example. Yeah, please. Someone says, I want to go to Florida on vacation. And so they want you to tell, you know, you look at a chart, they want to know if they should go, but that's not really their question. Their really question is when I get to Florida, will I be able to have a secret affair that my wife doesn't know about? And that's the question. And, so how do you and ask the question? <laughs> you say, what, what questions are underneath that question? Mm. And I learned that from not only Judge Judy, but from horary astrology, where you need to find out exactly what that question a person is really asking mm -hmm. so when a person comes in and they say you know a doctor cannot figure out what's wrong with me and i love it when doctors call me and they do with a mystery case because then i work under their wing and and uh you know you have you have uh you ask a lot of questions well they'll say my stomach's bothering me it's surprising how many people are pointing to the wrong part of their abdomen and think their stomach's bothering them <laughs> Right. My stomach's high up. It's not way down here. They're always going, my stomach. Well, that's not your stomach. 
So then you ask questions and, and uh, what does your doctor say? Have, have you seen a doctor? You never play doctor. Now, you have to take extensive waivers. You have to make sure everything you're doing is legal. You do not play doctor. I don't play doctor. You can give a hypothetical evaluation that their doctor will review. That's how I work. You cannot give a medical opinion, direction, prognosis, unless you are medically licensed. There's nothing in the world stopping from you from doing a surgery date for a voluntary surgery or helping someone with fertility dates. These are legal. These are, these are finding a date is not medical unless you are interfering with the surgeon. So I make sure that I've assigned waiver that the surgeon's parameters are worked with to make sure that this is indeed a voluntary surgery. You know, someone wants a breast lift and you know, they want a safe day. Well, they can do that at any time, but I make them sign on that there's no you know, medical thing under this that I don't know about. And then I pick the right day, the best dates to that look the safest within their parameters. So uh, this, is, this is just like training for any other career or skill. It's going to take time, practice, intel intelligence, and skill. And, and no, it's not for everybody. Just like uh, being a, a, a physicist isn't for everybody. Being a gardener is not for everybody. You know, I have a black thumb. <laughs> Every, my friend is a green thumb. Everything she touches, come, I'm a handy woman, everything she touches blossoms or anything she walks by blossoms. <laughs> if somebody gives me a plant, it's, oh no, the plant's going to die. Don't give me <laughs> Give it to your friend right away. <laughs> yeah. My herbs love me, but not house plants. I don't know what it is. Yeah, it can be very different. Well, that's so fascinating. It sounds like in a lot of ways that a medical practice, someone who's already a medical practitioner could really benefit from understanding astrological medicine. Um, is, is that true? Um, yes, yes, absolutely. The, uh, my goodness, if you were a medical practitioner with this knowledge, uh, I will give you a quote from the great William Lewis. And William Lilly is the astrologer who predicted the fire of London and was dragged before the courts because they thought he said it because he predicted it so accurately. And his famous quote, wait a minute, is it his quote? Oh, excuse me, it's not William Lilly's quote. It's Nicholas Culpepper's quote who wrote the, the first, uh, not the first, but the- The, um, the complete the, herbal. Complete herbal, which has been the longest in print book in the English language or so I've heard outside of the Bible or maybe the Bible. maybe even before the Bible. But he said, a physician without astrology is like a pudding without fat. <laughs> <laughs> and that would not be very good pudding. <laughs> no, well, in England, a pudding isn't a sweet thing, I think, in those days. I think it might have been you know, a thing, or I don't know what it was, but it meant it didn't, it didn't have any substance substance. Yes. Yeah. And I know that's an insulting uh, statement to physicians, but it is what he believed. And it's mm -hmm. rather amusing little statement. It was, it was what they thought in those days. And well, well, what can medical astrology see and evaluate that medical equipment cannot, can it? Oh, now here it can do so much. You know, the, the, I'd like to say the, the doctors have microscopes and all kinds of things, x-rays that can look into the body. They don't yet have anything that can look into the subtle pattern behind the body and the temperatures coming in, moisture levels coming in through the subtle patterns. They have nothing that can show them good timing for surgery and they can make terrible mistakes. There's always that person, you know, who, oh, you're fine, your heart's fine, and the person drops dead the next day of a heart attack. The chart can see this. When not to release someone from a hospital, when something is far more deadly or dangerous than thought, and in the discovery of uh, a cause they cannot normally find with all the tests, I was able to be very instrumental several times in saving lives finding the hidden cause, like the, like the gas leak that the doctors were unaware of because they couldn't see it. The mm -hmm. chart can see it. 
Like yeah. someone had a gas leak in their house and they were having headaches or something, but they couldn't track it. Yes, five doctors could find nothing wrong with them and they're slowly dying. And the chart showed poison through the air. And I did this for a health practitioner and she said she thought I was absolutely crazy and left. She was almost dead. She was losing weight. She was nauseous. And she called me several months later and she said, well, you're the one who got it right. It turns some workmen came in, found out she had a gas leak and she would have been dead if she hadn't slept with her window open. Every night. Wow. And the chart showed it so clearly, poison through the air. I didn't know what that meant. Today I would, I know Ediol, I would have immediately thought carbon. Mm -hmm. What's going on in your neighborhood, but no one else was sick. So, or, you know, something was odd. Uh, the charts will show the seat of a problem or the current cause that might be a doctor can't see. You know, it gives you, a, so Davidson was, there were, now there were several doctors that did and do practice medical astrology. It never was lost. And the great William Davidson, who has several available lectures, they're very hard to find. Um, he said, you can see so much in the twinkling of an eye and, and using this system. And he came to completely believe everything the chart was saying. I found it, I went, you know, I'm a, I was a skeptic. I spent years and years in the statistical study of astrology with scientists to prove it worked to myself. I would not do this if it didn't work. It would be a terrible waste of my life. Mm -hmm. we, it, it'd be a lot of effort spent too. <laughs> yes, it does work. So do you know any doctors or scientists that use medical astrology? I do. There are many. I wouldn't feel free. I can name the dead ones. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, most of it, many, many, many of the great physicians of the Renaissance, of course, uh, and the great herbalists like Culpepper was, he wrote a book on astrology, but uh, the physicist Burl Payne was studying and researching astrology statistically. Uh, the the uh, great physis physicist Arthur Young, who developed, designed the Bell helicopter, solved many problems of helicopter flight. I was his assistant for a year when I was a young woman, his only private assistant on his astrological research projects. And I believe he has a book that he describes some of what he was doing. Um, there are several doctors that I know personally who have come to me or that use medical astrology. There was a clinic run in my area whose lead doctor secretly practiced. They can't tell people still. There's still this, this uh, oh, collective strange uh, prejudice brought over from the medieval era. And they don't even know what they're trying to squelch. That's the funny part. We have chrono medicine today. So the, just in recent few years, medicine has discovered that timing matters. Wow, something astrologers never forgot. Timing matters. It's affecting how medicines are being used by the body. And so they have chrono medicine. They have chrono oncology called chrono after the Saturn is chronus. Mm -hmm. So they're now bringing in, they're trying to reinvent the wheel and refusing to look at 3,000 years of what astrologers have found, 2,000 years at least, of what astrologers have found uh, with timing. They just decide we're going to reinvent the whole thing because we can't use astrology. Yeah, it, it's, it's amazing how things come full circle, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it is. so yeah. We should never have in our minds that all doctors and all scientists are, you know, somehow uh, prejudicial against astrology because many are not, and many are astrologers. But the the um, you know the bureaucracy over everything is kind of keeping them from coming out. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because I uh, we work together in creating the Academy for Astrological Medicine, and on occasion I poll the the students, and we have about an equal audience: those who are practitioners, whether they're already medical practitioners in, in a medical practice or uh, medical astrology, and then half about half the people are just using it for themselves and their friends and family, which it can have tremendous insights 
uh, even for me personally, I've, I've learned why I am sensitive to even natural sugars. Um, I, when you, in the medical astrology forecast hour, uh, which you do each month, um, when you've put out the, you know, this is a time where if you have venous issues, you might feel a little twinging or something on, on, on schedule. Like, and I don't always write down the dates. Um, uh, it'll happen and I'll go back to the forecast and go, yep, that was on schedule. I mean, it's so fascinating. And so there's even just everyday purposes, uh, for this as well. One does not need to be a practitioner per se. That's so true. And I, on that forecast, uh, Tara, we, we have alerts, as you know, we have, we have a cardiac alert you know, for cardiac people or blood pressure alerts, uh, sugar alerts, um, other, you know, head alerts. Uh, and we have the good stuff, you know, like, like the next two weeks are particularly strong for building bone and muscle for those that need to be tonified. Uh, you know, just coming right up the first two weeks of uh, last few days of July, first few days, first two weeks of August are perfect for building bone and muscle, but uh, not particularly good if you have a lot of, uh, you know, problems in your ear, nose, throat. You need to, so, you know, this is hypothetical, you know, and it's not going to affect everybody, just some people with these issues. And then the practitioner can use the information. Oh, let's, let's take an herb that downloads that pressure. Or maybe you know, I'm 70 years old and I've had some heart problems. Maybe I shouldn't do heavy lifting on that day, mm. the, the cardiac alert. It's very useful and it's the best possible tutorial for learning any type of astrology because any type of astrology is based on how the planetary energies, hot, cold, moist, dry, fast, slow, tense, relaxed, how they affect our minds, our emotions, our relationships, our bodies. It's the basis for understanding all these other branches. And it was one of the first branches. And all these other branches came out of it. And the psychological branch was the, probably the last, last to grow, big, blooming, gorgeous branch. And, but it needs to look back at its roots sometimes. It's so interesting. And, you know, because the psychological aspect also is so subjective, right? And so there, it might be predicted in psychological astrology, this or that, but, but there's also the placebo effect. And so if you read it, are you also kind of initiating that, but when it's physical, it can occur and you can even look it up in hindsight, which I think the, the forecast is a great study aid in that sense too, because you can go back and you know, even look it up um, history, you know, this is when uh, I had this issue. What was going on at that time? Yes, and and so you know, like when when you're when you're having a huge amount of expanse to the head, you know, a lot of blood going to the head, which we've had with Jupiter and Aries, you know, just in a general way. Uh, how might that impact you emotionally? What we're seeing on the planet is a great deal of hot headedness. I'll tell you that. You know, more adrenaline. The adrenaline's going crazy. Aries rules the adrenal glands. Jupiter and Mars um, were in there for a long time together. And, you know, this excites testosterone, adrenaline, and there and brings energy to the head. Therefore, look at what's going on. And then, well, I'm not a believer anybody should be a slave to this. One should uh, be very careful to know that you rule your planets. But it's like, it's like you have a dog and, and the dog's getting restless. Well, you have to know, we'll take it on a walk or figure out what's wrong. So you live in a body. Maybe your body's getting more uh, impatient and angry. A lot of people have been. Well, what can you do to relax that? Especially as this aspect goes on. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is where you become, it empowers you to be the ruler of your moods as much as possible and to avoid you know health difficulties and other complaints so it does help on all levels of astrology but in my my opinion it's the best way to learn astrology of course i'm biased <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i but i think there's a lot of history i mean how, how many you've been reading charts for 50 some years that i mean you there's a certain point you really can't argue with experience and I love that, that you're saying, you know, that you can 
then you can be in control of, 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 of what's going on. You don't have to be a victim or just responding. You know, what comes to mind when you're saying that is when Mars was going through my first house. And had I not known that, which obviously happened many other times in my life, it felt really intense. Like my adrenaline, my reactions were super high. Would have been great for initiating a new, uh, a more vigorous exercise <laughs> regime, probably. Always, that's so, that's exactly it, Terry. You got it. You can always use any planet. Like last few, when, last time Moon was in Aries very recently, I was aware that I felt more impatient and angry for two days. Mm. I thought, well, what am I going to do? I don't like this feeling but it's my adrenal glands are stimulated. I was just snippy and pissed off with things. And I turned on some beautiful heart music. I tried the antidote approach, beautiful heart music. And then I was aware of it. So I tried to not be that way with people. And you do have some control. And I took a really vigorous walk. And I, I, it, it was there, but it wasn't controlling me. Mm-hmm. And I, so I, didn't, I didn't pick up the phone a few times because I knew I was in a bad mood. Yeah. I don't put that on someone. Yeah. yeah, it's perfect. And it just does really help to understand it, those types of things. Um, and it helps, you know, I'm in a, a Mercury ruled business. So when Mercury's in a funky spot, I can just prepare ahead of time and, and not um, be so like, gosh, darn it, what's going on? <laughs> Well, you know, like when Mercury's in a funky spot, it's like that's when all the, the computer glitches happen. So you always prepare. Yep. But physically, too, usually people are more forgetful or they're talking too much and everything's kind of going like this because it's also affecting us physically. Mm -hmm. and, and in the in the in the um, in the forecast, we do go over some other like how this may affect some careers or we do mention other things. Though it is it is. And we look at herbs that help, you know antidote these things. So. so what comes to mind, a great place to start is definitely the free intro welcome course, which is on the homepage and also the free resources at the top of the Academy for Astrological Medicine page. Would you say that the real entry point for anyone is the Medical Astrology 101? Yes, if they're serious and want to really take a course, okay. uh, really, really get down to business, Medical Astrology 101 with the textbooks and everything. If you if that's you just want something lighter fare, mm -hmm. uh, you can subscribe to the um, the uh, the academy and just look at the medical astrology primer, and then you have thousands of hours to relax and pick and choose. And nothing. you don't have to become a serious scholar and get textbooks, but you can see all kinds of. We have several courses with beautiful slides, and we have lots of audios and. There's many, many, we're, we're filling in all the seven, six branches of medical astrology. Medical astrology has different things you have to know. So you can either get real serious and, and take medical astrology 101. It's low screen, so it's very pleasant. You read books, you do exercises that bring in all 10 senses. You do reading, you listen to an audio, and outside of the three-hour uh, video primer, which really sets you up. It's for, you aren't hardly on computer at all. Mm. And uh, some people really love that. It's an old school course. And all the other courses are video, audio, video, and uh, very more modern. So we have something for everyone. And uh, there's a lot of just good beginner material. And we have a course on reincarnation, karma, and astrology. We've got a course on lunar nodes. We've got even a course on vocational astrology, surgery dates, um, remedials, the gemstone remedial course. There's yeah. a little bit of everything I think people can find. And uh, so especially if someone's curious, just go, go there, peruse. Um, the forecast is seeing it in action. And then we have um, the seminar coming up, medical, the oh. uh, health astrology seminar with Kira Sutherland and uh, now see new guest, um, Michael Bryan, which we're very excited about. So it's the future of medical astrology. There's wonderful presentations. And now uh, through the end of August, you can enter in, you can pre-register to win a seat to this 
one day seminar and it will be recorded. So if for some reason you're not able to make it or you just want to review, you can pre-register and uh, the recording will be available as well. So, um, you know, astrology, medical astrology in particular is really growing and thriving. And, and so if a person is interested, especially being in a niche um, as of astrology, it's it's really a great field. Yeah, and if, and if nothing, if you just want to learn about your sun sign, we have a, uh, Matthew Wood and I have a wonderful sun sign course with, um, uh, going into each sun sign in remarkable depth as to its uh, medical idiosyncrasies and tendencies and then the herbs that help those. And that's up on the academy as well. If yeah, That's a favorite course. Well, <laughs> we would be here for hours if you're mentioning and detailing each and every one of them. Um, so definitely check those out. Um, and we'll be here uh, sharing more as well on the podcast. And we have many more fun subjects to cover because it's just a fascinating topic in and of itself. Yes, so, thank you, Tara. I always, I always love, uh, Tara is such a good interviewer and I love working with her. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Um, believe it or not, I was a really shy kid. So there must have been something else in my chart that helped that to blossom. So <laughs> another fun topic. It is, you learn so much about yourself and it doesn't have to be a narcissistic thing. It really is, I think, a, a growth thing. It can really help you in your life growth as well. So I appreciate what I've learned. You've been my primary, well, my only astrology teacher at this point. I feel like I've learned a ton. I, I mean, I'll, I'll research stuff online, but it comes back to um, applying in medical astrology. And you're right. I think it is a terrific foundation and helps you to learn the other branches as well um, because it is so tangible. You know, it's like anything in life when you can really ground it in what who you are, what you're doing, we learn so much better, not just by reading something, but by applying it. And I think it's something that you can just innately apply, which makes it really, really, really interesting. So thank you. I've really appreciated lear learning with, for, with and from you along the way. And I totally look forward to more. We have more classes coming up, but uh, we'll talk about those later. Too much good stuff to mention. And we love teaching. We love doing it. So it's, it's a ton of fun and there's a great community online as well. So, all right. It's been a lot of fun, Judith. We'll uh, talk soon. I look forward to the next one. Thank you, Tara. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.